Thank you. Michael D. Rhodes recently retired as Associate Research Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. He was previously Assistant Professor of Physics at the United States Air Force Academy and was the Director of the United States Air Force Academy Observatory. He earned a Master's in Physics from the University of New Mexico and studied at Oxford University. He has degrees in Electrical Engineering, Egyptology, and Greek. Dr. Rhodes has published in Egyptology, Astronomy, and Latter-day Saint scriptural topics, including accounts of the creation. He co-authored with Richard D. Draper and S. Kent Brown, The Pearl of Great Price, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, and One Eternal Round with Hugh Nibley. He worked on archaeological digs at Giza and Petra. For the New Testament commentary series, he and Richard Draper are authoring the Revelation of John the Apostle, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Hebrews. His presentation today is the modern-day relevance of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. Dr. Rhodes. I guess I need my presentation up here. All right, uh, hard act to follow, uh, Kay. Uh, marvelous job, marvelous job. Um, about 44 years ago, I was a student here at BYU and uh, took my first Greek New Testament class from Richard uh, Anderson, uh, who uh, was a, uh, was, still is a great man, uh, and uh, learned much from him. Uh, Jack, uh, in his uh, talk mentioned uh, it would be nice to have Hugh Nibley with us here. Uh, having worked five years on uh, completing his unfinished book, I can tell you he's still here. Well, although written nearly two millennia ago, Paul's letters to the saints in Corinth are as relevant today in many ways as they were when he wrote them. The competitive, social climbing, status-obsessed, morally decadent society of the Greco-Roman world of Paul's time, with its worldly philosophies, has remarkable parallels with our own modern Western culture. And Paul gives valuable counsel on how to stay true to the gospel of Jesus Christ while living in such a world. Check my add-ons. I didn't know I had any. Cancel. Wow. Solar corrupted. Great, Scott. I'm talking about corruption. How, how appropriate. Let's get back to this. That's what I want. All right. The city of Corinth, uh, we have a, a nice picture here of uh, uh, the Temple of Apollo and uh, the uh, Acro Corinth, the uh, citadel of Corinth there in the background. Uh, during Paul's ministry, it was the capital of the Roman province of Achaia and the largest city in that province with an estimated population of around 100,000. Since the Isthmus of Corinth was only a little over three miles wide, the city had two harbors, Sencrie on the east, facing across the Saronic Gulf to Asia, and uh, Lachium, facing to the west across the Corinthian Gulf to Italy. The two harbors were connected by the Diokos, a road on which cargo and even light ships could be hauled. This unique geographical location at the crossroad between the eastern and western parts of the Roman Empire allowed Corinth to become a major commercial center between Europe and Asia. The city became a melting pot of peoples, including Romans, Greeks, Jews, and immigrants from the various Asian provinces. As one commentator has noted, Paul's Corinth was at once the New York Los Angeles and Las Vegas of the ancient world. Uh, New York, New York, for those of you who uh, 
uh, been there at that uh, uh, interesting place we call Las Vegas. Uh, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he explains in a bold and forthright manner the ways in which the members of the church there had strayed from the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. These included contention, striving for position and power, pride, false reliance upon the learning of the world instead of the knowledge that comes through the spirit, and sexual immorality. More importantly, he clarifies how to counteract these worldly influence by an application of the doctrines of the gospel, thereby providing us with some of the most clear and beautiful statements of those doctrines that are found in the scriptures. These include Christ as the center and focus of all we do, that the gospel of Christ can only be understood through the inspiration of the Spirit, the importance of keeping ourselves morally pure, partaking of the sacrament worthily, gifts of the Spirit, the, three, uh, the true meaning of charity, that beautiful 13th chapter of uh, Corinthians, the reality of the resurrection, baptism for the dead, the three degrees of glory, becoming a new creature through the atonement of Christ, enduring afflictions, and so on. In this paper, I will focus on just two topics that Paul dealt with, which are particularly relevant to us who live in this modern wicked world. First of all, the superiority of God's wisdom to the learning of the world and the soul-destroying sin of sexual immorality. Let's start with God's wisdom compared with human wisdom. The culture of the Greco-Roman world in which Paul traveled and taught had its roots in the remarkable development in Greece of the art of, of art, science, philosophy, rhetoric, literature, architecture, and political innovations in the latter part of the first millennium BC. These were in turn adopted and expanded upon by the Romans and spread throughout their empire. The Corinthian members had begun to interpret the Christian message through the Greco-Roman, uh, through Greco-Roman philosophy, and expected Paul to teach using the intellectual methods they were familiar with. Paul made it clear that this was not how the gospel of Jesus Christ should be taught and understood. He explained. Uh, I I will note that. Uh, all of the uh, quotes here from scripture uh, come from the uh, rendition that I and uh, uh, Richard Draper have worked uh, together on uh, rather than the uh, King James Version. Now, when I myself came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquent speech or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the mystery of God. For I resolved not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I appeared before you in weakness and fear with considerable trepidation, and my speaking and my preaching was not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the convincing proof of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on the power of God. The hallmark of Greco-Roman teaching and oratory was the use of rhetoric, eloquent, polished, well-reasoned argumentation designed to persuade. Paul emphasized that he deliberately chose not to follow this practice of the art of persuasion. He knew that true conversion can only come through the personal witness of the Spirit of God. The power of the gospel was contained in what Paul called to musterion, to teu, the mystery of God. Later manuscripts uh, have uh, the word martyrion, testimony, which the King James Version follows. Earlier manuscripts suggest that the correct word should be uh, musterion, mystery. My translation follows those early, earliest manuscripts. Uh, 
In verse 7 of this same chapter, Paul clarifies what he means by the word mystery, where he uses the term again. It denoted knowledge previously unknown, which God reveals only to a select group of people, usually through religious rite, and which was to be kept secret. The emphasis... The emphasis is on its property as something revealed, something too profound to be arrived at through human reason or intellect. Paul's use of the word emphasizes that knowledge of the Christian gospel comes strictly through revelation from God. Paul did not want the Corinthians to be converted to God's mysteries intellectually. He uses the term uh, through human wisdom, Sophia. The, the Greeks, uh, Sophia was the ultimate thing that Greeks and, and, and Greco Roman society sought for wisdom. A uh, philosopher, a philosophia, was a person who loved wisdom. And uh, he's making, setting this in stark contrast uh, through, uh, to that that uh, obtains through the Holy Spirit. Such a conversion cannot endure trials and tribulation. True conversion can only come through personal revelation from the Holy Spirit, through the power of God, uh, dunami teu, uh, dynamite, <laughs> okay? There's, there's power. Uh, the power of God is essential in a conversion process. Paul's use of the word emphasizes that knowledge of the Christian gospel strictly comes... Oh, I'm sorry, dropped down the wrong place. Um, anything short of this is not of God and has neither converting nor saving power. A quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. It has neither converting nor saving power. Paul goes on to contrast the wisdom of men with the wisdom of God. However, we do speak wisdom. He says, we, 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 we're still talking about wisdom, but we speak among those who are spiritually mature, but not the wisdom of this world or of the leaders of this present age who are doomed to perish. Instead, we speak God's wisdom, which is hidden in a mystery. Here's that terminology again, using mystery, which God foreordained for our glory before the world was. Paul admits that he does indeed speak a specific kind of wisdom, but it is radically different from the one which some of the Corinthian saints have become enamored with. His words, however, show us that there is nothing inherently evil about wisdom and using the intellect, but to be proper or correct, it must be guided and informed by the Spirit of God, which the world in general ignores, both then and now. Such wisdom is hidden in a mystery. As noted above, the Greek term mysterion, unlike the English word mystery, did not denote that which was impenetrable because it was inherently unintelligible or incoherent. Rather, it pointed to that which was too profound for human ingenuity and could not be obtained by unassisted human logic or reasoning. It could be gained only by the Spirit. Once disclosed, however, it made perfect sense to the spiritually mature. For those living in the last days, the Lord has promised that his uh, prophets, uh, if his that as his prophets abide in him, he will give them the keys of the mystery of those things which have been sealed, even things which were from the foundation of the world and things which shall come from that time until the time of my coming. Uh, the use of the term mystery in exactly the sense that Paul is using it. In the remaining verses of chapter 2, Paul explains with penetrating clarity the fundamental differences between spiritually obtained knowledge and knowledge obtained through the intellect. He begins with what appears to be a scriptural quote, uh, but it is not found in old, the Old Testament, at least as it exists today. 
But as it is written, that which neither eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into a person's heart, all those things God has prepared for those that love him. You'll recognize that uh, this is uh, uh, paraphrased in the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants as well, in that marvelous vision that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received of the three degrees of glory. I've lost my, oh, okay, here we go. The phrase emphasizes the complete inability of human senses or the power of human mind to even imagine what God intends for the faithful. Paul continues, but to us, God has revealed them by the Spirit, for the Spirit fathoms all things, even the deep things of God. Harking back to uh, what uh, Kent Brown said about the, the deep, uh, the deep things of God, the, the uh, profound things he has. For what human being understands human things except the human spirit that is in him? So too, no one understands the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which comes from God, so that we can understand the things which God has generously given to us, which we also speak, not with words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things by means of spiritual things. Only the spiritually mature, those who love God and are worthy of the inspiration of the Spirit, are privileged to know these things. This inspiration comes through uh, what Joseph Smith revealed as the light of Christ. The light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth light to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Speaking of these deep things, Elder El Alvin R. Dyer stated, the deep things of God, also referred to scripturally as the mysteries of the kingdom and the mystery of his will, pertain to laws, principles and conditions of man's eternal existence. The whole vast and intricate system of life is a mysterious challenge unto man unless he is truthfully informed. Elder Maxwell, God's purposes, his patience, his power, and his profound love and other truths are among what Paul called the deep things of God. In, in contrast, Paul stresses that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The adjective translated natural uh, psychikos, which in Koine Greek referred to the life of the natural world and whatever belongs to it, is in contrast to the realm of experience whose central characteristic is pneuma, uh, spirit. Uh, so it's, it's natural, it's unspiritual, it's worldly. That's, that's the terminology. And it's interesting that Paul didn't use the, the uh, uh, Greek word physikos, uh, uh, which also means physical, but, but has, has a different a nuance than, than this psuche uh, uh, that uh, he uh, specifically chose here. The words natural man correspond exactly with the King Benjamin's characterization of the natural man as an enemy to God 
as found in Mosiah chapter 3, verse 19. President Joseph Fielding, uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith noted that it behooves the Latter-day Saints and all men to make themselves acquainted with the true, only true and only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. But can we through our own wisdom find out God? Can we by our unaided ingenuity and learning fathom his purposes and comprehend his will? We have, I think, witnessed examples enough of such efforts on the part of the intelligent world to convince us that it is impossible. The ways and wisdom of God are not the ways and wisdom of man. How then can we know the only true and living God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent? For to obtain this knowledge would, uh, would be to obtain the secret or key to eternal life. In verses 15 through 16, Paul brings to a conclusion his entire line of thought that he had begun developing the 16th verse of chapter 1. This contains four parts that, that can be outlined in this manner. A spiritual person discerns or correctly judges all things. But that person can be correctly discerned or judged by no understood unspiritual person. For who knows the mind of the Lord so that he can advise him? But we have the mind of Christ and can therefore make proper judgments. The second line stands in contrast with the first and reverses the image in the first line. Paul plays on the same word used in the first line, anacrino, to discern or judge. The natural man cannot discern or judge correctly the spiritual man, while the spiritual man, who can fully understand the profane and temporal world order, can discern and properly judge those therein. The third line gives scriptural support to Paul's point. In the second line, to get his point across, he reworks Isaiah chapter 40, 13, turning it into a question. Who can know God's mind and counsel him? The implied answer, of course, is no one. The point is that no sensible person would want to match wits with God. The jab is pointed at his Corinthian detractors who are so taken with the wisdom of the world that they have denounced the cross and with it the resurrection. Paul's reproach skillfully shows them that rejecting the cross and saying that God would not work in that way are tantamount to telling God what he can and cannot do. That's real foolishness. With the final line, Paul returns to the point of the first one. He explains why he and those who follow him can properly discern and judge. We have the mind of Christ. Here the nuance of the word mind, nous in Greek, appears to refer to the Savior's thoughts as revealed to the righteous by the Holy Spirit. Elder Oaks, the Apostle Paul said that persons who have received the Spirit of God have the mind of Christ. I understand this to mean that persons who are proceeding toward the needed conversion are beginning to see things as our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, see them. They are hearing His voice instead of the voice of the world, and they are doing things in His way instead of by the ways of the world. In chapter 3, Paul issues a stern warning to all those who think they are wise. Let no one deceive himself. If any one of you, if any one of you think, thinks he is wise in the ways of this world, let him become a fool so that he might become truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness from God's point of view. For it is written, he traps the wise in their own trickery. And further, the Lord knows that the reasoning of the wise is futile. That brings us now to uh, the second point of focus, the soul-destroying sin of sexual immorality. The standards of sexual conduct in the Greco-Roman culture of Paul's time were in direct conflict with the strict standards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fornication, adultery, and homosexuality were all accepted norms. Corinth in particular was notorious for its lackness in this regard. The Greek verb korinthiazomai, 
means liter literally to Corinthize, meant to commit fornication. Paul's ringing denunciation of these soul-destroying activities is as relevant to us now as it was to the ancient Corinthians, as we see our own culture becoming more and more tolerant of divinely prohibited sexual misconduct. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, Paul gives a detailed list of the kind of sins through which a, uh, through which a person will be prevented from inheriting the kingdom of God. Prominent among these are acts that deal with the misuse of the divine power of procreation. Pornoi, moikoi, malakoi, arsenokoitai. Let's look at each of those in turn. Greek, doesn't, Greek has a wonderful uh, role to it. Types of sexual sins. Pornos. Uh, we all recognize this word immediately. Pornography. It was a general term for one who engaged, engaged in sexually immoral acts. Uh, the uh, King James, uh, that is, uh, one who had sexual intercourse with anyone who was not his or her lawful spouse. The King James Version translates this as fornicators. Those who are sexually immoral uh, catches uh, the modern English sense of the word. The next word, moikos, was an adjective used nominally and lit, oops, uh, drop down one, uh, referred specifically to an adulterer, that is, a married person who has sexual intercourse with someone other than uh, his or her spouse. King James Version uh, uses the same term, adulterer. The next term, malakos, was an adjective used nominally and literally meant soft. It is translated as effeminate in the King James Version. In this context, it referred to the passive male partner in a homosexual act. This was in contrast to the arsenokoites, uh, a noun denoting the active male partner in a homosexual act. Uh, uh, the King James Version translated this as abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, Paul emphasizes that any sort of male homosexual activity is immoral and sinful in the eyes of God. Although Paul does not specifically mention female homosexual activity in his letter to the Corinthians, he does mention it in his letter to the Romans in the very first chapter. For this reason, God turned them, the, the Gentiles, over to disgraceful passions, for just as their women have replaced natural sexual relations for those that are contrary to nature, likewise the men also have abandoned natural sexual relations with a woman and are inflamed with lust for each other, men committing indecent acts with men and receiving in themselves the fitting penalty for their aberrant behavior. Paul makes it clear that uh, he condemns both female and male homosexual relations, which he describes as parafusin, against nature, unnatural. It's interesting that both uh, Philo and Josephus, uh, writers uh, contemporary or uh, near contemporary with Paul, use exactly that same terminology in describing uh, homosexual activities. And he also calls them plane, uh, literally wandering astray, aberrant behavior. In uh, the phrase there in uh, Romans where he talks about men committing indecent acts with men, he uses the preposition en, uh, in, rather than sun or meta, with, uh, and that's significant. En designates a close personal relationship in which one is under the control or influence of others and is often used to describe a person's relationship with God or Christ. Paul is making it clear that uh, 
homosexual relations are particularly destructive of our relationship with God and Christ. Now, the Corinthians came up with an excuse uh, for uh, the immoral activity in which they were participating. Uh, this seems to have been a slogan bandied about uh, in order to justify their indiscriminate, morally wrong behavior. The slogan being, Pantamoi existi, I can do anything I want. Paul responded, I can do anything, but not all things are beneficial for me. I can do anything, but I refuse to be controlled by anything. We do indeed have our agency to do whatever we want, but there are many things we should not do because the negative consequences that are associated with them are detrimental to our eternal salvation. So Paul then goes into great detail as to why sexual immorality is so wrong. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. This physical body that we have uh, is in the image of God. And one of the uh, characteristics of Godhood is the ability to procreate. God has granted us here on this earth a temporary trial run to see if we can properly use that divine power. And uh, to misuse it is an offense against God. He uh, describes uh, this, this sexual immorality with the word porneia, which of course is, is the abstract noun uh, from the, the previous uh, noun, pornos, which describes someone can uh, participating in sexual immorality. This is sexual immorality in, in, in the most uh, general sense. Fornication, adultery, homosexual relations, anything that is a misuse of the power of procreation. Continuing his discourse, Paul says, don't you understand that your bodies are members of Christ? This is a powerful imagery that he's evoking here. Should I take the members of Christ and make them the members of a whore? Certainly not. Don't you understand that one who is joined together with a prostitute becomes one body? For it is said they shall become one flesh. Referring back to Genesis when God uh, talks about Adam and Eve in, in, uh, as part of their, their marriage is, is to become one flesh in the process of procreation and producing human life. But one who is joined with the Lord becomes one spirit with them. That's a powerful image. Would we take the holy body of Christ and, and join it together with a whore? Uh, Paul is, is really trying to emphasize the, the deep seriousness of sexual sin in all its manifestations. All right. He closes then by saying, we must flee from sexual immorality. You want to avoid it at all costs. It is uh, one of the soul-destroying sins. Paul emphasizes that sexual sins differ from all others because our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Don't you understand that you are a temple of God and God and the and the gods and God's spirit dwells within you. If anyone tries to corrupt God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Uh, when you think of, of, of the most holy place on the face of the earth, it's, it's one of the temples of God and, and our each and every one of our individual physical bodies should also be held in the same sanctity as we hold those temples. Paul's clear and unambiguous 
Condemnation of all sexual immorality is especially relevant to the world in our day when sexual perversions are tolerated and even encouraged. Some might argue that some of the other things that Paul prohibited, such as members of the church using a civil court, the eating of meat offered to idols and idol worship, women praying with head coverings, meat of animals strangle, killed by strangling and eating blood are no longer prohibited to Christians. So why premarital sex, adultery, and homosexuality? Why should that be any more prohibited than those things? Well, the answer, of course, is that we base our understanding of what is relevant to morality today, not merely on the words of Paul, but on the words of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, those 15 men we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. Let's look quickly at uh, some uh, statements by some of those leaders. It brings us back to the important point made earlier. We can only know the things of God by revelation and the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Church, church leaders today are united in their emphasis on the eternal verity of the law of chastity. Beautiful statement here from President Kimball. That the church's stand on morality may be understood, we declare firmly and unalterably it is not an outworn garment, faded, old-fashioned, and threadbare. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his covenants and doctrines are immutable. And when the sun grows cold and the stars no longer shine, the law of chastity will still be basic in God's world and in the Lord's church. Old values are upheld by the church not because they are old, but rather because through the ages they have proved right and will always be the rule. Elder Bednar, in the, the most recent April conference, because a physical body is so central to the Father's plan of happiness and our spiritual development. Lucifer seeks to frustrate our progress, uh, progression by tempting us to use our bodies improperly. One of the ultimate ironies of eternity is that the adversary, who is miserable precisely because he has no physical body, entices us to share in his misery through the improper use of our bodies. The very tool he does not have is thus the primary target of his attempts to lure us into spiritual destruction. Violation of the law of chastity is a grievous sin and a misuse of our physical tabernacles. To those who know and understand the plan of salvation, defiling the body is an act of rebellion and a denial of our true identity as sons and daughters of God. As we look beyond mortality and into eternity, it is easy to discern that the counterfeit companionship advocated by the adversary is temporary, temporary and empty. Elder Oaks, the power to create mortal life is the most exalted power God has given his children. Its use was mandated in the first commandment, but another important commandment was given to forbid its misuse. The emphasis we place on the law of chastity is explained by our understanding of the purpose of our procreative powers and the accomplishment of God's plan. Outside the bonds of marriage, all uses of the procreative power are to one degree or another a sinful degrading and perversion of the most divine attribute of men and women. President Hinckley, prophets of God have repeatedly taught through the ages that the practices of homosexual relations, fornication, and adultery are grievous sins. Sexual relations outside the bonds of marriage are forbidden by the Lord. We reaffirm those teachings. The Lord has proclaimed that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and is intended to be an eternal relationship, bonded by trust and fidelity. 
Latter-day Saints of all people should marry with this sacred objective in mind. Marriage should not be viewed as a therapeutic step to solve problems such as homosexual inclinations or practices, which first should be clearly overcome with a firm and fixed determination never to slip to such practices again. Having said this, I desire now to say with emphasis that our concern is for the bitter fruit of sin is coupled with Christ-like sympathy for its victims, innocent or culpable. We advocate the example of the Lord who condemned the sin yet loved the sinner. We should reach out with kindness and comfort to the afflicted, ministering to their needs and assisting them with their problems. We repeat, however, that the way of safety and the road to happiness lie in abstinence before marriage and fidelity following marriage. The Family Proclamation The family is ordained of God. Marriage between man and a woman is essential to his eternal plan. Children are entitled to birth within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and a mother who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. We warn that individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouses or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. Further, we warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. These latter days that precede the return of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, we are faced with many of the same challenges to living the gospel that the ancient saints did. Paul's counsel to them applies equally well to us. Carefully studying and pondering of his writings as clarified and expanded by the words of modern prophets and apostles can aid us in overcoming the world. Thank you.